All right, hey guys. Um, I'm excited to talk to you today. Um, just a little lesson. Oh, well, we'll be kind of talking about a lot of stuff. So again, I'll be uploading all this into Odysseyware. I'll call it like video three so that you guys can find everything easily. And there will be a question associated with it in the assignment. And I decided that for this assignment, I put in like a secret word. Um, so that you know that I know you've watched the recording and that secret word I will show and say um, sometime in this video and that will be the answer to the question. Okay, for one, I apologize for my crazy hair, but it's my Ramon shirt wearing day, so I'm going to have crazy hair. Okay, so before we get started, I just wanted to do a couple of class reminders. Um, one... It's kind of email etiquette-esque. When you're talking to me, please be careful of your tone. I've had a couple of different students who've kind of come off to me kind of like, I need to grade everything right then and there because they deserve it. Um, kind of more of an entitled thing. I mean, I do need to grade everything you do. And in my fairness, I always try to get back everything you grade within 24 hours. That's a really quick turnaround for a lot of different teachers. But I take that time, extra time, to make sure that you have everything you need just in case you need to redo anything or you want feedback. I do that. So just be kind of careful of your tone that you use with your emails with me because I am your teacher and you need to respect me and you need to just be careful what you say. Two, um, I kind of want to talk a little bit about, um, again, spell check. Guys, you need to be careful when you're writing things and you need to make sure that you're spelling things. This is all about credibility. I'm not going to believe that you're a credible writer if you aren't going to spell right, that's just one of the things about credibility. And maybe we need to do a whole lesson on about credibility. And maybe we'll do that. Um, but just be careful. Double check, triple check everything you turn in. I know it's just one more extra added step. But you need to do it, okay? Um, you're in an online world. You have very many a resource readily available at your fingertips with typing. You can do that. Okay, this kind of leads me to my next point, which is plagiarism. Plagiarism is really big, and plagiarism is also really big in the online learning world. And I know it's really easy to do. Okay, I get that. But you can't do it. And I can tell when you plagiarize. Before, at other schools when I taught, when I saw somebody was plagiarizing, I gave them a zero. Just without the ability to make it up. I will do the same thing to you, except then you have to go through this whole reporting process, and ICON has a really strict plagiarism policy, so don't do it. I do check, and it is very easy, okay? Please don't do it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, a little, excuse me, about plagiarism. Okay, so plagiarism, what is it? Plagiarism carries real consequences, receiving a low grade, failing a class, being expelled from school, and even losing a job. Learning how to use other writers' words and needs correctly will help you avoid plagiarism. Okay, look at this little snippet from the Boston Globe. Globe suspends sports reporter Borges. Newspaper editor cites plagiarism. The Boston Globe yesterday suspended without pay for two months of a veteran sports reporter, Ron Borges, after allegations that he had plagiarized a portion of a football column from another sports writer. The Globe's editor, Martin Barron, said Borges had included in his football notes column last Sunday material written by a reporter from the News Tribune of um, Tamaka. The Globe does not tolerate plagiarism, Barron said in a statement. Extensive passages written by Tacoma reporter were used verbatim in the column by Borges. That is prohibited. Borges also will also be barred from broadcast appearances over the next two months, Barron said. Okay, when it uses that word verbatim, verbatim is a Latin term, and that means word for word. That's what verbatim is, word for word. That's plagiarism, okay? Okay, identifying plagiarism. For a class project, Son wrote about a Habitat for Humanity, an organization dedicated to helping people obtain affordable housing. Here's an excerpt from one of the articles Sean used as a sort. 
International had barely hung out its shingle in 1976 when Faith Little, the wife of a Presbyterian minister, started its first affiliate in her basement in San Antonio. Since then, more than 16,000 affiliates have sprung up around the country and built or rehabilitated more than 226,000 houses worldwide, demonstrating the power of a grassroots movement. Okay. Avoiding plagiarism by putting the essence of the original text into your own distinctive language as Sean has done. Okay, so here's that original excerpt. This is what Sean writes. Habitat for Humanity International was created in 1976. Since then, Habitat was built more than 226,000 houses around the world for those unable to own their own home through traditional means. Okay, plagiarism occurs when you copy information from the source. Look, demonstrating the power of grassroots movement demonstrates the power of grassroots movement. That's plagiarism. That's verbatim. Don't do it. Okay, if you use an author's original ideas, credit the author. Otherwise, it's like claiming you came up with those ideas on your own. Okay, see, Sean Summary acknowledges the authors whose ideas he had used. According to Edward H. Hatfield, okay, this is how you avoid that plagiarism. Another problem is a problem is paraphrasing a source too closely. Changing a few words does not make the work your own. Okay, see all these underlined everything? That's plagiarism. You can't be doing that. Paraphrasing. Um, it, it, it's a tricky line to follow, so just make sure it's your own words and not exactly what the author is saying. This note changes a few words, but it is essentially the same as the original. If you do read that for a minute, you'll see that it is kind of very, very similar. You need to avoid that. Okay, is the note on the right an acceptable paraphrase of the information on the left, or is it plagiarism? Okay. Throughout the world, the cost of houses varies from as little as $800 in some developing countries to an average of nearly 60000 in the United States. Habitat houses are affordable for low-income families because there is no profit included in the sale price. Mortgage length varies from 7 to 30 years. Okay, here's what he wrote. Depending on where Habitat builds, the prices of houses range from 800 to 60000 Because they are sold without profit, low-income families can afford to, pay, to buy them. Okay, this is a paraphrase. This is meaning the same, but the wording is distinctly different from the source. Okay, it's not the same. You can do this as long as you're giving credit. Okay, is the note on the right an acceptable paraphrase or plagiarism? The excerpt on the left, or is it plagiarism? Sorry. Okay, here's the article. Fraying under the new leadership that is trying to centralize the organization, Habitat for Humanity International is asking affiliates to sign an agreement that would establish a quality control checklist. And the new policy gives headquarters a cut of each donation. It receives that it is earmarked for an affiliate, and the changes are meeting with op opposition. This is what he wrote. New leadership trying to centralize is asking affiliates to sign a pact to establish a quality control list. Mm, you're getting way too close to how this author said everything. This is tantamount to takeover because they have to send headquarters part of each donation earmarked. Mm, same. Okay, this is plagiarism. Although not exact, the original text is obviously copied. Okay, this is obvious. This is not a paraphrase. Okay, what is common knowledge? Not all information needs to be cited. Ideas that are considered common knowledge are free from this rule. Habitat for Humanity creates homes for those who cannot afford homes by traditional means. Jimmy Carter is best known advocate. A piece of information found in three separate independent sources is to be considered common knowledge. Okay, which of the following ideas do you think might be common knowledge and which would you have to cite? Okay, common knowledge. Sweat equity is the work families put into their homes. Jimmy Carter, the 39th president, lesser known by 1964, Miller. Okay, you're not going to find these. You can you know, take a chance to look over these. Follow the common rule, common knowledge rule that we just went over. Okay, and then on your own, I want you guys to just kind of go over this. And I will put this PowerPoint up for you in Odyssey where just so that you can understand what plagiarism is. Okay. 
So, avoid plagiarism. Don't do it. It is serious and actually is illegal. I didn't know if a lot of people know that, but it is illegal. So, don't do it and you will get zeros and written up and disciplined. And I mean, you don't want to get expelled from the school for plagiarism, okay? Just cite your sources. And next week, we'll talk about citing and what that looks like specifically because I'm kind of, uh, I don't know how to say this, I'm kind of a big stickler for citing um, just because I think it's important and especially important to know for English classes, especially with research papers, etc. So we'll learn about that next week. Now what we're going to talk about today is kind of, I know like a lot of people are in a lot of different places, but we've been going over poetry a lot and some Shakespeare works and other different sections of English 10. So I thought we take a minute and we talk about poetry and different poetic devices and sonnets, etc. because that's kind of a big thing. And some of you have been getting confused and I know in some of your assignments it's asked you to specifically cite some poetic devices used and not a lot of you have been able to do that or just use basic ones like imagery and repetition. So I thought I would give you a bigger scope of what those all are. Sound devices and poetry. Sound device. Resources used by poets to convey and re reinforce the meaning or experience of poetry through the skillful use of sound. After all, poets are trying to use a concentra concentrated blend of sound and imagery to create an emotional response. The words in their order should evoke images and the words themselves have sounds which can reinforce or otherwise clarify those images. All in all, the poet is trying to get to you, the reader, to sense a particular thing and use, a, use the... A little, a little, excuse me, and the use of sound devices are some of the poet's tools. Okay, some types of sound devices used by poets. Alliteration, onomatopoeia, assonance, and consonance. Okay, we're going to talk about those. Alliteration, the repetition of the same initial letter or consonant sound or group of sounds in a series of words, including tongue, tongue twisters. For example, she sells seashells by the seashore. The goal is that repetition, but as you see, it's the same consonant sound. S, 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 S. Then there's the S, S, okay? Now, onomatopoeia. The use of a word to describe or imitate a natural sound or the sound made by an object or action. For example, boom, snap, crackle, pop. The goal is sound right there. Now, assonance. This takes place when two or more words close to one another repeat the same vowel sound but start with different consonant sounds. For example, look, we have the M, the S, the W, the B. Those are not vowels. Assonance deals with vowels, and that's always going to be the different after the consonant, if that makes sense. So men sell the wedding bells. The goal is rhythm. Okay, and that's because of these repeating vowel sounds that come after a different consonant sound, if that makes sense. Just use this sentence as your guide. Men sell the wedding bells. Now, consonant refers to the repetitive sounds produced by the consonants within a sentence or phrase. This repetition often takes place in a quick succession, such as in pitter-patter. For instance, the words chuckle, fickle, and kick are consonant with one and other due to the existence of a common interior consonant sound, the CK, the fick, fickle, chuckle, and kick. Does that make sense? Okay, so I just want you guys to know that those are sound devices and they're used and um, poets use them all the time. So you just kind of get to pay attention for them, especially with like assonants and consonants. You really need to focus and you need to, I always say you need to actually be looking for them when you're trying to look for different sound devices. Okay. Poetry devices, a wide range of words from which to choose from almost every thought, numerous plans, or methods of arrangement of these words which can assist the writer in developing cognate or strong expressions pleasing to his reader. Some types of poetic devices are figurative language, simile, metaphor, hyperbole, or personification, imagery, symbolism, illusion, connotation, and denotation. We've gone over connotation, denotation, and imagery. Let's get into some of these other ones. Okay, a simile, comparing two online things using like or as. For example, Mrs. B is as funny as a clown. 
meaning Mrs. B is hilariously awesome. A metaphor is comparing two things by saying that one is the other and does not use like or as. For example, our class is a zoo, meaning our class is crazy. Hyperbole involves an exaggeration of ideas for the sake of emphasis. It is a device that we employ in our day-to-day -day speech. For example, I'm dying of embarrassment or I have a million things to do. That's an example of a hyperbole. The goal is an amusing effect. Personification. Human characteristics are given to an object or an animal. For example, the stars winked at me. The stars are, were twinkling, okay, because stars cannot physically wink at you. But if you're saying something like that, it gives human-like characteristics to them, which makes us understand them better. Or really connect to them. Us humans like to connect to things. Imagery. Okay, we'll go over this quick. The name given to the elements in a poem that spark off the senses. Despite image being a synonym for picture, images need not only be visual. Any of the five senses, sight, hearing, touch, taste, smell, can respond to what poets write. Okay, we went over that in The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. It's probably a great word for that. Okay, symbolism, the practice or art of using an object or word to represent an abstract idea. An action, person, place, word, or object can all have symbolic meaning. When an author wants to suggest a certain mood or emotion, he can also use symbolism to hint at it rather than just blatantly say, saying it. Okay, so that means like something means something. Like for example, like a dove normally symbolizes peace. Or when people wear purple, that means royalty. Okay, it's all about the symbolism. Okay, next we have an illusion. It's a figure of speech that refers to a well-known story, event, person, or object in order to make a comparison in the reader's mind. For example, when someone says, are you by Romeo? Or guess who thinks he's an Einstein? Or this feels like the Garden of Eden. Okay, an illusion literally is like something that everybody's going to kind of know and kind of understand. Okay, or when somebody says, like, don't pull a Kanye, you don't want him to interrupt you. Okay, connotation, we've went over this. It just re uh, refers to a meaning that is implied by a word apart from the thing which it describes explicitly. Words, words carry cultural and emotional associations or meanings in addition to their literal meanings. Words may have opposite or negative connotations that depend upon the social, social cultural, and personal experiences of individuals. <clears throat> For example, being dog-faced is a negative connotation or being childish is a negative connotation, but being at home is a positive connotation, or dove symbols are positive. Denotation, the literary or dictionary meanings of a word in contrast to its connotative or associated meanings. If you search for a meaning of the word dove in a dictionary, you will see that it, that it's it, the meaning is a type of pigeon, a wild and domesticated bird having a heavy body and short legs. In literature, however, you frequently see dove referred to as a symbol of peace. The difference there. Okay, so what are some literary terms that you already know? Try to think of some. Or what are some literary terms important to know? And what will these terms tell us about the story? Or a poem. Think about these when you're looking for that, for those terms, okay? Especially if the question is asking you to. Okay. Also with poetry comes conflict, tone, mood, theme, point of view, and paradox. Okay, so these are aside from the actual, I guess, these are aside, I'm going to say this, sorry, I'm being a little airhead today. Um, they're not the physical things in it that make up the story, but it's almost like the feeling, the mood. We're going to kind of get into all of them, the conflict, the things that make a poem or a story, the story, Okay. This dude is. Okay. Whoa, too fast, Mrs. Peterson. Okay, conflict, a literary element that involves a struggle between two opposing forces, usually a protagonist and an antagonist. Okay, protagonist is normally the hero. Okay, antagonist is normally characterized as the villain. There's also different types of conflict. You have man versus self. Man versus man, man versus nature, and man versus the supernatural. Okay? 
So this is very much like Batman, you know, going against himself, an inner struggle, man versus man, Batman versus the Joker, man versus nature. Normally that's like Bear Grylls feature, uh, versus any other type of nature or man versus the supernatural. Um, that's like Harry Potter. Well, he's kind of supernatural because he's a wizard, but versus like Voldemort. It's anything kind of weird or strange. Oops. Okay, tone is the attitude of a writer towards a subject or an audience. Tone is generally conveyed through the choice of words or the viewpoint of a writer on a particular subject. I want to ask the authorities what is the big deal. Why do not, why do why do not they control the epidemic? It is eating up lives like a monster. I want to draw the attention of the concerned authorities towards damage caused by an epidemic. If steps were not taken to curb it, it will further injure our community. Okay, both examples are examples of tone, but they're they're very very different. I mean. Normally, you're going to want to listen to kind of this one because they sound a little bit more educated and know what they're talking about. This one kind of isn't and it's a little bit more confusing, but has a little bit more feeling. This one is a little less withdrawn. It just kind of depends on who you are, but there's different tones to it, even though it's talking about the same thing. Writers do that too. You got to pay attention for it. Mood, a literary element that evokes certain feelings or vibes in readers through words and descriptions. Usually mood is referred to as the atmosphere of a literary piece as that creates an emotional situation that surrounds the readers. Mood is developed in a literary piece through various methods. It can be developed through setting, theme, and tone. Okay, so lots of things go into different types of mood. Okay, so normally you kind of like, oh, this kind of feels creepy or the mood is weird. Or the mood is lighthearted. Okay, it all just, a lot of things go into it. Okay, theme. A main idea or an underlining meaning of a literary work that may be stated directly or indirectly. Okay, a lot of times we have to discover the theme for ourselves. Major theme. An idea that a writer repeats in his word, making it the most significant idea in a literary work. Well, umbrella, the minor thing. So really, it will cover all the little things. Minor themes are refers to an idea that appears in a work briefly and gives way to another minor theme. Okay, how to find how to find the theme of a work, a poem, anything. Through the feelings of the main character about the subject he has chosen to write about, through the thoughts and conversations of different characters, the experience of the main character in a course of literary work, or the actions and events taking place in a narrative story. Okay, so you got to pay attention to that. That's why close reading is so important because you're going to catch up on all these things like major themes and minor things. Okay, next we have point of view. This is very important because you kind of need to understand what kind of point of view or the angle the story or the poem's coming at. This is the angle of considering things which shows us the opinion or feelings of the individuals involved in the situation. In literature, point of view is a mode of narration that an author employs to let the reader hear and see what takes place in a story, poem, essay, etc. First person, point of view involves the use of either the two pronouns I or we, like we went to the grocery store, or I went to Ulta. First person. Second person, point of view employs the pronoun you. You were walking to Walmart. You got an ice cream. Third person, point out view uses pronouns like he, she, it, or a name. Like Amanda went to the grocery store. She hit him. Paradox. A statement that appears to be self-contradictory self -contradictory or silly but may include a latent truth. It is also used to illustrate an opinion or statement contrary to accepted traditional ideas. A paradox is often used to make a reader think over an idea in an innovative way. Your enemy's friend is your enemy. I am nobody. What a pity that youth must that what that youth must be wasted on the young. A wise fool. Truth is honey, which is bitter. I can resist anything but temptation. 
Those are paradoxes. They're kind of self-contradictory, but it makes you think. Okay, um, I'm going to kind of show you a little trick to kind of get a lot of these things and identify them. When I was teaching in a brick and mortar school, I would make my students do this thing called TV casting until they wanted to cry or leave or thought I was a crazy person. They probably do and still think I am a crazy person and maybe I am, but this will help you. I promise. Just like TA Babe C helps you be a write, better writer, this is going to help you identify everything in a meaning piece of literature or poems specifically. It's awesome. I, mean, I got to show you. Okay, so TBCast. What is TBCast? That stands for title, paraphrase, connotation, attitude, shift or shifts. Title revisited and theme. So, title. You look at the title and you get, and before you even read it, you just take a look at what this poem is going to be about. Don't stress about this. There really isn't a right or wrong answer as long as it's an educated answer. So like if you're reading something about a girl who's in the title is 16, you look at the title and you think, oh, yeah, I think this is going to be about a, a 16 year old girl or somebody who's turning 16. You're, you should have some reasoning or evidence. I think this is going to be about a girl turning 16 because the title is 16 and that leads me to think that it's going to be about a birthday. Okay, the road not taken. We're going to use this again because it's awesome and familiar. Title, okay, before you even think about reading the poetry or trying to analyze it, speculate on what you think the poem might be based about upon the title. Oftentimes, author conceal the meaning in the title and give clues in the title. Jot down what you think the poem will be about. So, the road not taken. The author did not take a certain road, literally. The author is struggling between making two choices, figuratively, or when a person has two choices to make, it's called a path or a road. Okay, that's just my own, like, taking this title. That's it. Next, you need to paraphrase it. We just learned about this. But you're going to write it in your own words, exactly what happens in the poem. Each line in your own words. At this point, don't try to get deep. It's really just kind of very literally. You're taking it word or line by line, how you would say it. Okay, look at the number of sentences in the poem. Your paraphrases should have exactly the same number. It could be shorter but it's still the same amount. So if I'm looking at a 12-line a poem, guess how many lines my paraphrase version is going to be? You got it? 12. Okay, what is the difference between a summary and a paraphrase? Um, a summary is shorter or more condensed, just focusing on the theme and big events, but a paraphrase is saying exactly what happened just in your own words. Okay. So you're going to paraphrase it. This is not a summary. So we're going to take this. There are two paths in the fork, uh, that fork in the woods. I'm sorry that I couldn't take both at the same time. And being a traveler, I stood a long time trying to see down one road as much as possible. Up to where it turned and I couldn't see anymore because the path was overgrown. Then I looked at the other road, just as nice, but looked more trustworthy because it had grass and looked used. As if those who came across the fork took the path and wore it down. Okay, we had talked about this poem last week. This is just saying it kind of more simpler. This is a paraphrase. Okay? Next, we're going to move on to the C. And tip cast, or tip cast, however you want to say it. Connotation. Here are the words in the poem that contribute to the connotation, or what are the words? Looking for imagery, figures of speech, a simile, a metaphor, symbolism, diction, point of view, sound devices, alliteration, onomatopoeia, rhythm, rhyme. Okay, this is where you dig deep and you look back at the whole poem, looking for these things specifically. It might seem a lot of, like a lot of work, because it is. But why? It's going to help you dig deep and help you understand every little thing you're reading. Okay, so connotation. So, oh, you know what? We got the point of view right here. It's first person. Okay, you're using the word I, imagery. Use it all over to describe the road. This is where you'd actually write, write down specific examples. And it rhymes. How awesome. Next, we're going to go into attitude. After you look at the devices used in the poem, consider how this these form the attitude or the tone of the poem. We talked about tone. The tone or attitude cannot be named with a single word. Think complexity here, okay? 
Explain why the words or phrases device is contribute to the attitude. You need to explain yourself. I cannot get inside your head to understand what you are saying. You need to tell me. Okay? Okay, the author describes the path in detail in order to give the reader a peaceful attitude. The author describes the path in detail in order to give the reader a contemplating attitude. Which path to take? The author gives the reader a hopeful attitude by choosing the less traveled path and saying that he will be talking about it years from now because taking the road less traveled has made all the difference. Okay, that's describing the attitude or the tone. Next, you're gonna look for shifts. Consider where the poem begins to change in the tone. There has to be, there will always be a specific change. Okay, consider looking for in, uh, for a change in keywords like but, yet, however, although. Those are key connector words right here that are going to show you something is different. Punctuation, if you keep seeing periods or colons or even like ellipses, like something is consistent but then all of a sudden he throws in a dash or colon, or ellipses, those are the three dots, one, two, three. Okay, you're gonna look for stanza divisions. If things look completely different somewhere else in the rest of the poem, that's a shift. A change in a line or stanza length or both, or if a sense of irony pops in there. Changes in sound that may indicate changes in meaning, that's again, you'd be looking for those sound devices, or changes in diction. Okay. The author begins a poem by simply observing the past and describing them in detail for the reader to understand the difference between them. He shifts the poem by using an exclamation point, seeming excited that he has finally chosen the path. Boom, and then there's evidence. Oh, I kept the first for another day. This is where the shift happens, it's changing. The poem then seems to pick up pace due to the author's excitement. Okay, see, a punctuation is a shift right here. You just have to look for it closely. Next, we're going to go back to title again, and we're calling it Title Revisited. Now, go back to the title and think more deeply about what it means. Take what you have learned thus far in the poem by looking at the other sections of TipCast or TPCast, and it could be considerably different than in your initial guess at the title meaning. Based on what I have read in the poem, the title is talking about a more figurative path. Although the author is struggling at first to decide which path to take a physical walk on, we can interpret this to mean a figurative path. A figurative path can, th can be thought of as a choice. Choices are called paths or roads. So this poem may be talking about a choice that he made. Okay, so it's awesome. Now we've dug a little deeper right here. So what are we going to do next? The last T stands for theme. What is the poem saying about ex human experience, motivation, or condition? What is the overall message? What subjects or subjects, what subject or subjects does the poem address? What do you learn about those subjects? What idea does the poet want you to take away from with you concerning these subjects? Remember that the theme of any work of literature is stated in the complete sentence. Again, we talked about theme versus motif. This is a complete sentence here. Okay. The author ultimately decides to take the road less travel, thus telling the reader that perhaps in life they should take the road in, li in life less traveled. So do, things, so do things that may not normally do, or do things that people wouldn't normally do, like standing up for what you believe in or going after a dream that others may not support. Okay. Standing up for what you believe in. Okay, I can't tell you how important it is to use TipCast, like when you're analyzing poetry or even like a major work, even a, you, the paraphrasing would be terrible for that, it would take forever, but this specifically for poetry is kind of important because it breaks down everything easily for you, but you're breaking it down and it's your thought process, but it's a correct formulated thought process. Remember how in my first video when we were talking about T A B C, um, I said math. In math, they use formulas, so why can't we for English? Just think this is another formula. You're plugging in your thoughts, and what do you get out of it? What's the answer? Wholehearted thoughts, real thinking, and you can do it. And this helps you to do it. So use it. 
Okay, so I know some of you are on sonnets, but before I get into sonnets, and not even sonnets, but more particular Shakespeare, and he is the king of all sonnets, I bow down to him, or bow down to thine, be, that's what he would use. Sorry, English, little humor there. Before I begin, I want to kind of give you your keyword for the answer for your Odyssey Wear question. And that keyword is Kiwi. 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 If you watch this video, you should answer to the Odyssey Wear question. The answer is Kiwi. Okay? Let's get into sonnets. Okay, we're going to talk about what a sonnet is. A sonnet is a 14-line lyric poem, usually written in an iambic pentameter that has one or several rhyme screens. You guys learned about lyrical poems, so this should be familiar. The two most common types of sonnets are Petrarchan, or an Italian sonnet, and Shakespearean, or English sonnets. A less common type of sonnet is the Spenserian sonnet. I bet you didn't know there were multiple types of sonnets. It's not just Shakespeare who wrote them, it's other people. So we're going to learn a little bit about them. Whoop. Okay, Petrarchan, or the Italian sonnet. This type of sonnet is named after the 14th century Italian poet Petrarca, known as Petrarca, Pet Petrarch in English. I'm probably butchering his name right now. And I apologize, Petrarca, Petrarch, whoever you are. Petrarch created many original concepts of sonnets, such as popularized and perfected the form, wrote more than 300 sonnets addressed to a woman identified only as Laura. Man, what not us ladies want to be Laura? Use Petrarchan conceits, ingenious and fanciful comparisons of two apparently very different things. For example, love is a baited hook. A nice fisherman reference for you fishers out there. Okay, Petrarchan sonnets form. There's two different parts: an eight-line section called the octave and a six-line section section called the sestet. The rhyme scheme goes as a b b a a b b a for the octave and c d e c d e c d c d c d or c d e d c e for the sestet. Okay, those are just some common ways to kind of discover what they are. The octave always presents a problem, question or idea, or the sestet resolves that problem or idea. The turn or the shift in focus or thought usually occurs between octave and sestet, often in line nine, and acts as a transition between two sections. Like this. This is a Petrarchan sonnet. Earth has not anything to show more fair. Dull would, dull, blah, 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 dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty. The city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning, silent, bare, ships, towers, domes, theaters, and temples lie upon unto the field and to the sky, all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. Never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendor, valley, rock, or hill. Ne'er saw I, never felt a calm so deep the river glided at his own sweet will. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep, and all the mighty heart is lying still. It's an example of a Petrarchan. There's the octave, and there's the idea. Sestet emphasizes this idea. Okay, I'm not going to spend too, too much time on these different types of sonnet forms, but I just want you to be aware and have this as a resource. Shakespearean sonnets. All... Hail, mighty Shakespeare. The Shakespearean, our English sonnet, is named after William Shakespeare, of course. Shakespeare wrote more than 150 sonnets. All of his sonnets have a male speaker. Many deal with the subject of love. Hey girl, I hear you like iambic pentameter. Sorry, I'm cheesy. Shakespearean sonnets, um, Shakespearean sonnets form. Four parts, three lines, Three four-line stanzas called quatrains and one two-line section called a couplet. The rhyme scheme normally goes A, B, A, B for the first quatrain, C, D, C, D for the second, E, F, E, F for the third, and G, G for the couplet. You will notice uh, uh, the form is very similar, the same. 
Three quatrains express related ideas, examples, or present, or present a question in tentative answers. The couplet sums up the speaker's conclusion or message. The turn or shift in focus or thought usually occurs in the third quatrain. A second turn often occurs in the couplet. Shakespeare likes to get a little crazy with the shifts. Okay, Sonnet 130 by William Shakespeare. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be but white, why then her breasts are done? If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet I will, but yet will I know that music hath far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground, and yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as she belied with false compare. Cotrains, the three of them, right here. Express related ideas. This couplet right here comments on the situation. Now let's talk about the Spenserian, or the lesser known sonnets. The Spenserian sonnet is named after the Renaissance poet Edmund Spenser. Spenser's Amorate is a sequence of eight to nine sonnets which record a man's two-year courtship of a woman named Elizabeth. Spenser kept the division and organization of the standard Shakespearean or English sonnet but varied the rhyme scheme. For example, like ABAB -A -B for the first quatrain, BC BC for the second, C D C D for the third, and E E for the couplet. Kind of similar to the Shakespearean one, but you're gonna find that it's a little different. Obviously, you can tell by this rhyme scheme. Okay, sonnet number seventy-five by Edmund Spencer. One day I wrote her name upon the strand, but came the waves and washed it away. Again I wrote it with a second hand, but came the tide and made my pains his prey. Vain man, she said. That dust in vain essay, a mortal thing, a mortal thing, so to immortalize. For I myself shall like to this decay, and eke my name be wiped out likewise. Not so, quote I, let baser things devise, to die in dust, but you shall live by fame. My verse, your virtues, rare shall internize, and in the heavens write your glorious name, where, when as death shall all the world subdue. Our love shall live and later life renew. Okay, now this is just a little pop quiz. If you want to take it yourself, you can pause this video and take a guess at what the answer will be. So here's a pop quiz. Did you get any of them right? Sonnet has 14 lines. A blank sonnets are also known as Italian. That would be Petrarchan. Sonnets are written in iambic pentameter. A Petrarchan conceit is a comparison of two like items. That would be false. They are very different when you are comparing them. Like love is a baited hook. Why would you want to be baited by a hook when you're in love? Okay. So, I know that was a lot of information. Again, that's why I kind of do videos so you can watch them again and again because I know you would love to do that. Um, and just so you can kind of have them as a resource for you. And again, I'm going to put this, put both of the PDFs on plagiarism and poetry devices, how to break down poetry and different types of sonnets um, for you in Odysseyware. Don't forget the keyword today is Kiwi. And I think we're going to keep this up because I think it's kind of fun and I like it. And it kind of ensures that you watch this video. Okay, so keyword is Kiwi. That will be the answer to the Odyssey Wear question. Kiwi. Don't plagiarize. Please watch your tones with me in your emails. Respect me, please. Um, sonnets, poems, literary devices. I hope after this, this kind of helps, gives you some different examples. And I hope the TV cast, tip cast, kind of shows you how to break down a poem. And I hope that it'll help you in the future. Please use it. Next week, I think we will be talking about citing. And maybe what it even talks about, maybe even talk about what it means to be a credible writer, incredible person, because those are important and you're going to use writing and writing throughout your whole life. This is one application I promise you that you will read, that you will use. You will read. You have to read all the time. You read signs. You read pamphlets. You read menus. 
um, but you're going to write everything. Even if you don't go on to college, you have to learn how to write a memo for work or different type of orders or anything really. You have to know how to write correctly. So I think we're going to be talking about talking about citing and being credible. Um, hope this helps you. Until next week, if you have any questions, again, email me, call me, text me, comment on the YouTube video below. I feel kind of silly saying that, but please do. And we'll go over it. So I hope you have a great day and I hope this helps you. Have an awesome day Englishing.